Okay, now we'll talk about permanent magnets, and I'll explain to you why some things can be magnetized and that magnetization is relatively permanent. Think about a bar magnet, for example. Typically, we have a, a magnet shaped like this, and there's a north pole on one end and a south pole on the other. The question is, why? Why is it magnetized? We learned earlier that a magnetic field is produced by moving charge. And there's no electric current flowing through this bar magnet. It's not plugged into it plugged into anything, there's no current moving through it like there is through a wire. So why is there a magnetic field? Well, there is no electric current moving through the magnet, but there is moving charge in the magnet. And specifically, the electrons inside the atoms of this magnet are moving. And in fact, the electrons are moving and they're spinning. And it's mainly the spin of the electron that produces the magnet. Let me draw a little iron atom down here. Here's the nucleus, and there's a bunch of particles in the nucleus, protons and neutrons, and then there's a bunch of electrons around the nucleus. In fact, iron has 26 of them. I'm just going to draw a few. But these, these electrons are spinning, and each electron produces a little magnetic field. And so let's draw an arrow to represent the direction of the spin. They could be spinning one way or the other. And so let's have a little arrow here that represents this electron spinning and producing a magnetic field in a certain direction. Well, if two electrons spin in opposite directions, then they tend to produce magnetic fields that cancel each other out. But if two electrons spin in the same direction, they tend to produce magnetic fields that add up to a larger magnetic field. And in an iron atom, I said there's 26 electrons. It turns out that 15 of those, the point here is more than half, more than half of them are spinning the same way. So they're producing an overall magnetic field that doesn't completely cancel out. So you can picture an iron atom, if you want to picture, picture it as a little sphere, you can picture it as a little magnet that has a north pole and a south pole. Each iron atom is a little magnet and produces its own little magnetic field. Now most permanent magnets are made of iron because iron is the most magnetic material. Some other materials such as nickel or cobalt are also magnetic, but iron is the most magnetic. Now let's see how these ideas make a permanent magnet exactly that, a permanent magnet. And the key to understanding this is to understand what we call magnetic domains. So let's picture our bar magnet here. And there's the North Pole and the South Pole. And let's imagine one little tiny piece of it right here. One little tiny section. And let's zoom in there. So here's this tiny section. And inside this little section is billions and billions of atoms. This is really microscopic. This little piece that I'm calling a magnetic domain, and it, and it probably wouldn't be a rectangle like that. Let's, um, but let's say there's this chunk of the bar magnet that we're looking at and inside that little piece which itself is microscopic even though it contains billions of atoms inside this are a bunch of atoms and I'll just draw a few and let's suppose these are all 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 lined up all these atoms are lined up so that the north pole is at one end and the south pole is at the other so these little atoms are all lined up this way well, if all of the atoms in the domain are lined up that way, and the domain is just this region, this little piece of the bar magnet, if they're all lined up that way, then that domain itself is a magnet that's much bigger than one atom. It's made of billions of atoms. And the, the bar magnet is made of a lot of those domains. Now, in an unmagnetized piece of iron, let's look at this picture. This picture up top here represents an unmagnetized piece of iron. And the, the little regions, all of these little different regions in this picture, are mag magnetic domains. And you can see the arrows indicating the direction, which would be north. So in this case, in this one over here in the corner, the north would be over here at this end, and the south would be over here at this end of this domain right here. And that's represented by this arrow pointing this way. And you can see these different arrows are just arranged basically at random. They're all pointing in different directions. Each of those domains is a little magnet, 
but the directions are essentially random, and so they tend to cancel each other out. In a magnetized piece of iron, like this one down here, you can see in this case, these, a lot of these magnetic domains are oriented pointing to the right. A whole lot of them. Not all of them, see that one's going to the left, but enough of them are pointing to the right that it produces a strong magnetic field in one direction. We would end up with a magnet with a north pole over here and a south pole over here. Now, how does a magnet become magnetized? How does it get in this situation with all the domains oriented the same way? It turns out that placing a piece of iron in a magnetic field can cause it to become magnetized. So it's an external magnetic field that affects the iron and magnetizes it. If you place a piece of iron in a magnetic field, some of the domains are going to switch direction, or some domains that are already pointed that way might grow while others that are pointed the other way may shrink. And so the result is more or larger domains oriented in one direction. Now you should also understand that heating or damage or, or impact can damage a magnet. If you drop it or bang it or something, that's going to shake the atoms around. And if you heat it, heat, remember, is the vibration of the atoms at the molecular level. So if you, if you beat on the magnet, or if you heat it up, you can shake those atoms enough, and you can cause the alignment of the atoms to, to change. And you basically can randomize the alignment of the atoms, and that, that can cause the overall magnetic field to, to cancel out. Now this magnet, a magnet could attract another piece of iron. Say you had a permanent magnet here. Say here's a north pole and here's a south pole and you put an unmagnetized piece of iron here. Well the magnetic field produced by this magnet, and I'll draw some field lines here. They go from north to south like this. There's this magnetic field and notice these field lines, these field lines affect this other magnet. And they cause the domains in that piece of iron to start to align and it becomes magnetized. And so you end up with a south pole here and a north pole there. And then this north pole is attracted to this south pole. So an unmagnetized piece of iron can have uh, have its domains induced into an, into alignment by another magnet and it becomes magnetized and then they stick together something like wood or some other non-magnetic material won't be attracted to a magnet because it doesn't have magnetic domains to align like that and then understanding these domains also allows us to understand why breaking a magnet in two creates two separate magnets. If you have a magnet like this with a north pole and a south pole and you break it into two pieces, then because the magnetization exists because of all these little domains, all these domains still exist in these individual two pieces. And the alignment is still basically the same as long as it hasn't been damaged severely in the process of breaking it in two. And so you end up with a north pole and a south pole on each one and you don't get two separate magnetic poles. The reason that one piece is still an entire magnet is because there's still thousands or billions of domains in there that are still lined up the same way. So there's still a, a, a specific direction to the magnetic field from all of those domains. It's not as big as the original magnet, but it still has a north and south pole.